I think we can go ahead and start, Kari. Okay, thanks, Alan. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties, and I'm um, on the phone. We hope to fix it, but we're going to go ahead and start. And first, um, let me begin by thanking Scott McCoy and Inside View Press once again for sponsoring this season's NAT chat and our new video format. We're so appreciative. And of course, Alan and Tom for their continued support of the NAT chat. And we're thrilled to have Melissa Cross here tonight, and I can't wait to see her beautiful face as soon as Tom and I fix the video for me. But um, I think let's, um, let's begin by, Alan, do you want to give them just a brief tutorial about the raising of the hands? And, um, sure. and then we'll turn it over, and Melissa, maybe start with the um, Conan video, I think we decided? Yep. Well, the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We're glad to have everybody here, and uh, we, uh, you'll find on your panel over there, there's a place uh, for you with a little hand uh, held up. And uh, as you think of questions, if you have a question you want to ask audibly, uh, you can click on that, and when we get to the time for questions, uh, we'll, we'll filter through those. Also, if you don't want to use audio or don't uh, want to speak, you can also, down in the bottom, type a question there, and that will go into our question queue for the time uh, as we move along with tonight's um, presentation. So we're glad to uh, welcome Melissa Cross. We had a great time in Boston with Melissa when she was uh, with us this summer. And I think Tom's queuing up a little intro for this. is a classically trained vocal coach and scream expert who teaches heavy metal and punk rock stars how to scream. Her new DVD is called The Zen of Screaming. Please welcome Melissa Cross. You know you make me want to Okay, now this is a uh, this is a real thing. You've taught uh, famous uh, famous rockers how to scream. Is that right? Well, they already knew how to do it. I right. just teach them how to do it so they can do it all night, every night. Okay, because people can literally shred their vocals, and and some of the people like Andrew WK is right. that right? You've taught him how to how to like completely belt it out. Exactly. Well, okay. he knew how to do it, but he sort of sliced it up a little bit. Now, everyone has their favorite. I'm sure you do, too, Pat, like famous rock screams. Oh, yeah. And people like Roger Daltrey with The Who. With David famous, Lee Roth. With David the, Lee Roth the, had the great one. I've always thought Axl Rose had one of the greats, you know, uh, in Paradise City. I mean, oh, this, my goodness. This, <laughs> I do settle down there, yeah. I do my quads to that one. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? And, and I listen to it, and I think, I don't know how he's doing that. Why don't you be scared, man? You know, and he like, he keeps that for like a really long time, like, ah! and you can tell he's like making a sandwich while he does it. That's really good. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an amazing person. Uh, I, I can fly, too, but that's, you're not a flying expert, so you won't see it tonight. Um, that's, a, that's actually pinched falsetto, what you're doing there. I don't say falsetto, that sounds girlish. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I can go low, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. No, I can't. Um, <laughs> that's pinch falsetto. Yeah, I didn't know, know what it was. I did. <laughs> Are you insulting me right now? No, no, no. You're really good. <laughs> Thanks. But that I, was great. You did, Conan. Just like... <laughs> really good. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> But what you want to do is you want to learn how to scream, not just make notes, but yes. actually actually go, you know, like. Right, and, 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 and that's a big part of heavy metal is to be like, Rrr! you know, and just having fire come out of your. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Are there different types of screams? Yeah, there's that, you know, death metal scream. Can you bark? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that. turning in right now. <laughs> Anyone turning in right now with no context? Oh, this chicken counter. <laughs> you guys have gone crazy. <laughs> Wait, 
Yeah, even okay. the higher one too. You know? Yeah. You know, Okay, that's a, that's a, no, that, that's a, that's losing your cell phone signal, what you're doing. Exactly, or a pressure toilet. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, okay, so how is your screen? Can we hear your screen? Is that a... But I think, yeah, but I think, what, but that's, you're doing it, but you're doing it very quietly. What you're teaching these people to do is they're doing it much loud, right? Okay, so here's the deal, right? You don't want to think of it as loud. That's how you get into tr trouble. That's ah. how you slice it up, because then you go, <laughs> you actually, like, you know, slice <laughs> everything up. The gag reflex kicks in. That's what you don't want to do. You want about one quarter of a gag reflex. You just want a little, <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> what? How did a cat come into there? What? I want to go see the bands you're coaching. <laughs> Let's go check out the pterodactyls. I don't feel like demons are watching this going, uh, that's not how we scream at all. In a pony of screams, there's fire. Ozzy Osbourne is what yeah, you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Let me see. How, how do I do the face? Yeah, work your face, okay? Let's make a little face. Switch it up. Big 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 face. Switch it up. Right. It's all about attitude. It is. It has to come from the heart. Not right. imitating. Right. You don't want to imitate your favorite hero. You right. You want to actually come from within. So we have exercises to teach you how to emanate this from yourself instead of listening to something you think you should sound like. Right. This is really cool. It's all very cool. Yeah. I wish we had more time because uh, we, we, we need to learn all this stuff someday. Ah! But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can't, can't be part of the exercise. Ah! Ah! <laughs> um, Heavy metal comes... From the heart. <laughs> That's right, Pat. Wow. We learned an important lesson here today. <laughs> That's the line they cut out of Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it, is, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense, got it? <laughs> the uh, the Zen of Skinny, you gotta come back sometime because I want to learn more. I think I've got there's so much I could do. Yeah, because you want to sing, scream, sing, scream, want to you know translate into different sounds. I just have one song, the whole song. But you know, do different. Oh, you're not coming back now. No, no, no. That's my I don't know why I have to do shema 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 first. I don't know. That's just what I have to do. <laughs> That's my process. Look for my DVs D soon. I can't even say DVD. <laughs> the set of screaming vocal instruction for a new breed is available on www.melissacross.com. Don't know where you came up with that name. Uh, good website, uh, Melissa Cross. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Okay, Melissa, thanks. Thanks for being here with us tonight. It's all yours. My, uh, hey everybody, my fan is making a, a wretched noise, so I went off for a second trying to get my iPad in, in check, but I don't know the web ID, so if you're having a horrible noise, I'm sorry, I'll try to make better noises to make up for it. Are you, are you hearing my fan? Just a little bit, but it's okay. Oh, awesome. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Kari, for asking me. Um, I, uh, I guess what I, uh, should I talk now? Should I tell everybody yes. what I'm here for? Yeah. Is it still my turn? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I guess um, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I'm not just a screen person. Um, I was teaching singing for a good 12 years before I landed into this screaming thing. And I'd like to think of myself as a singing teacher, not a scream specialist. But 
um, because I am, you know, a PTA mom and a, you know, a singing teacher, and uh, it's such an odd thing for me to be you know, teaching screaming. I think that that was a, a national story that got a lot of press. Hence the Conan um, appearance and uh, the uh, all the hubba hubba hubba. Um, what happened to me is that a friend of mine asked me to help him with some artists who were uh, in his recording studio. And at that time, in the mid-90s, uh, this heavy metal thing was only underground. Now it's much more above the radar. Um, but at that time, it was an underground thing. And they were doing this screaming thing. And they couldn't get to a recording session without uh, basically coughing up blood. And he asked me to help. And so when I heard it first, I was frightened, but I never liked to say no, and I always like to accept the challenge. So what I did is that I mimicked it in such a way at a soft volume, and eventually I put a um, laryngoscope down my throat at the doctor's office, and I figured out a way for these guys to get that sound without uh, hurting themselves. Um, and so I figured it out. And uh, it got around to all the metal people that I had figured this out. And they all came one by one by one. And I had this practice full of streamers. Still have singers, but I, um, that's how it all happened. And I guess what I should tell you is that you know I was a performer for um, most of my life. Ever since I was five, I was you know, lip syncing in front of the mirror with a with a hairbrush, but my father was uh, British and very proper, and um, he taught me to do things properly. So I took singing lessons, and I took ballet lessons, and I wanted to be the best of the best of the best. And when I was 12 years old, they told me I couldn't be a ballerina because my neck was too short, and my arms were too short. So then I decided I was going to be the best actress in the world. And I also played the piano, and I loved to sing, and I got in it. Um, I was baby June and Gypsy, and all of a sudden I, uh, I joined a rep company, and then I went to the Interlock and Arts Academy, and at 16 I went to England. I went to the Old Brick Theatre School, very good theatre school. I studied acting um, for four years. I also continued to study classical voice. But at the end of all that, I decided to be a rock, a rock star. <laughs> except I didn't get to be a rock star, but I got very close. But anyway, um, what happened is, is that maybe 20 years later, someone asked me to uh, teach them how to do it. And I said, I needed the money. And I said, why not? And I really loved teaching. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it more than anything. And uh, that was 1990. And so it was about you know a little bit in the early 2000s, I got this screaming thing, and I've been doing it ever since. So that's the that's the beef on me. Now, um, I guess what I'm here to tell you is a lot of people um, are uh, confused about rock singing, and um, I think that um, what I have discovered is that um, non-classical and classical technique are different, but they have a lot of similarities great deal of similarities, and I, I want to tell you what those are, and um, I also want to tell you how I came to realize that they're similar. As I said, um, I was a rock performer, and I was studying, singing my art songs in the voice lessons, but I was in a punk band, and none of the sounds that I was doing in my lessons had anything to do with what I was doing at CBGB's. So what I did was I ended up just screaming my guts out, and I got a little injury. And I was given the option of having surgery or doing behavior modification with speech therapy. I was lucky enough to have a very, very good speech therapist. Not a licensed one, but still a very good one. And she sort of gave me the keys to the kingdom. Because what I realized is that what she taught me in speaking, it seemed as though there was a great deal of similarity with the placement of what she was teaching me in speaking as in my classical lessons. And I thought, hmm, 
because that's not what I was doing at CBGB's. I was completely using all in my throat. There was absolutely no head resonance in what I was doing at CBGB's. But I was being taught to speak with something that seemed a bit more, you know, in the mask. Um, and so what happened was I realized that my singing got better, but it was also this incredible like, correlation that I felt between this feeling of placing vowels up here instead of speaking down here like I did in Britain, you know, they taught me to speak like this. Because I came from Texas and I had this really high voice like this and they said, oh no, Miss Murray, that won't do, you must speak like this. And I pushed my voice down for a long time. So I was speaking incorrectly and I was singing incorrectly. So anyway, um, basically, uh, being an imaginative person, I came up with a lot of imaginative concepts that basically track like that second harmonic in vowels, but not the same vowels that we use in classical music. Because when you sing rock music, it's more like an acting gig. So the vowel shapes are more like speaking, but you really cannot have a sort of self-consciousness about the sound. You really have to kind of be in the moment. And I know you have to be in the moment for any kind of good singing. But in rock singing, it's really not about the sound of the voice. It's more about the authenticity of the feeling, regardless of what the voice sounds like. Hence, you know, Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen, they, they all don't have, like, pretty sounding voices. But there's something very authentic about the way that they feel. And they use notes and they pitch vowels, but the vowels sound more like speaking. However, I want to say that it is not sing as you speak. It is not that at all. And that's what I wanted to talk about. There's a lot of misconceptions. It's just rampant. I mean, there's all kinds of, like, people that say that you, they think you need to squeeze it up like this and, like, do it like an animal or, like, all these kind of static positions for singing rock music and for belting, and it's just not that at all. It really is about the middle voice. It is the same as classical good training. A middle voice, a good middle voice, a dynamic registration, going from register to register without breaks, that is essential for all genres of music. It really is. So um, I just wanted to... Um, warn you about people that have tricks about doing static positions in singing rock music because it can be very damaging. It also doesn't sound very good and it's also very not authentic. So anyway, um, my DVD, the first DVD is called The Zen of Screaming and I kind of tricked all those screamers because you see the warm-up that I gave them is the warm-up I gave everybody all along. There's nothing really special for screamers. The second DVD is about vocal distortion. But the first DVD, unfortunately, <laughs> for them, is that they had to start from the very beginning with the proper amount of breath pressure, some level pressure, and placement, and just like the same stuff that everybody learns except for I changed the names of everything so that it didn't sound like classical. So, for instance, that placement of coming out of your face, I put a pencil in their teeth and I have them imagine over the pencil and that expansion of the rib cage. For girls, I call it strapless bra. And for guys, I call it rotunda. And I use all these little buzzwords so that they can recall these feelings in an instant moment without perseverating on that. So it's just a thought that comes in and out very quickly. And I have a series of exercises that uh, coordinate all of those things, and um, it's 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 very similar to classical. It just doesn't have a lot of vibrato in it because we have to control our vibrato in um, non-classical music. So um, I don't know. Um, you know, I call this overtone instead of overuse, and that's because this tracking of that of that second um, harmonic in my exercises, I track that second harmonic in the lower voice. And then what's really remarkable is I find that by maintaining that imaginative 
feeling of that, that above the pencil, and I use the vowel E. By maintaining that through um, the passaggio, it is like a sort of consistency that occurs, and the breath pressure kind of comes with it in a very um, organic way without them thinking about shifting gears. Um, and with the screaming thing, and I want to talk to you about the distortion thing, because it's funny, no one really addressed that raspy voice. It's been going on since you know, Jimmy Durante and Louis Armstrong and Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and you know, Little Richard. I mean, it, that sound has been going on for a long time, but no one really looked at it. And I really thought that it needed to be looked at. And what I found is that you don't have to scrape your throat to get that sound. Um, not at all. In fact, if you scrape your throat, you're going to get hurt. So I found a way to do it without doing it with quite so much aggression. And also, I found a way that by changing the shape of the vocal tract, like a resonating strategy, just like we do with all, with all kinds of singing, by changing the shape of the vocal tract, we change the frequency of the scream. And this was very, very important to heavy metal singers, because just like an opera singer singing over the orchestra with the higher frequencies like elevated above the rest of the orchestra, if not being about volume, but being about those frequencies, that is also the case with heavy metal singing and rock singing. In other words, if you have that upper overtone going on, you don't have to be loud. It doesn't have to be loud. So, when I teach that raspy kind of thing, because, you know, there's heavy metal, and I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the kind of metal that is not on the radio, but it's just pure screaming sometimes. There is no pitch. It's just, the scientific word is chaos. It's absolute chaos. There is no periodic vibration. There's no pitch. It's just... <laughs> So that doesn't hurt me at all. <laughs> I can actually change the shape of the vowel. <laughs> See that high one goes over that it makes it sound much louder because that high frequency is there. So anyway, that was a very, very um, useful thing for uh, the metal screamers, because they were doing it with volume because they thought they needed to make it feel like it sounds. So they were doing road rage and trash through room stuff. And believe it or not, I know many of you think that there's absolutely no reason why you should listen to this music. But unfortunately, these guys make a ton of money. They make their livelihood doing it, and there's tons of kids that have a great deal of fun listening to it. It's a uh, it's not satanic. It's all in good fun. It's not, you know, druggy stuff. It's all just a load of fun. And uh, it probably is, you know, your reality TV, video game, you know, kind of vibe. It's certainly not my generation, so I can't be a part of it. I don't hang out in the mosh pit. I don't think that uh, <laughs> I couldn't possibly, like, do any stage diving or anything. So I'm kind of a den mother about this thing. But anyway. Um, I felt that I did a great service by figuring this out because a lot of them weren't able to carry on with their careers doing it the way that they were doing it. So anyway, I recently um, did some high-speed um, laryngoscopes with a high-speed camera, and I want to show you what uh, that sound looks like. And there's some very interesting things about this. Um, let me see if I can pull this out. Here it is. So, Great. While you're uh, getting those up, uh, just remind people that you can click on the hand over there if you want to ask yes. a question a little bit later. And you can okay. also type a question in, and when we get to those, then you can uh, also... Uh, uh, okay. So I'm... Oh, wait. I don't know how to do this. Um, tell me what I'm supposed to do. Remember to oh. click on Show Your Screen. Oh, yes. I got that. I'm just going to show this this um, this uh, uh, fly thing. Shall I do that now? Sure. Here we go. Okay, so this is that sound. This is the high-speed camera. I'm not seeing it on my screen. This is the high-speed camera. 
There we go. And this is that sound that I was making. Now you can see that the, the vocal folds, by the way, this is less than a second of, um, of uh, vibration here. Uh, this is a high speed camera, so basically what you're seeing is this length of uh, footage is just one second. So it wouldn't have a sound that goes with it because you wouldn't be able to um, synchronize this because this is in very slow motion. I believe it's like 600 frames per second, something like that. So anyway, what you can see, what's very interesting, and you see that Niagara Falls thing coming at the bottom? Let's see, can you see my pointer here? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, you see that, that fluid, which is actually mucus, but it's quite normal. Um, that is, um, what that is showing is those puffs of air that actually strike the vocal folds. So when you are um, singing or speaking, there is a periodic like uh, blast of air that comes and vibrates the folds. So that liquid that's doing that is actually showing that air, and I just thought that was absolutely fascinating. Now what you're seeing here is this sound. That's well, very, um, there's no pitch there because there's no periodic vibration, right? Now I'm going to show you another one where, on this one, this is very interesting because you can see at the bottom here, right, there is a periodic vibration and this is that raspy tone that where you have a pitch and you have the raspiness, right? So basically, I have that fry sound going on, that ah, but I also have a ah, and I've mixed those two together. So what I have is a noisy uh, note, but I'm not using, I'm not scraping my throat, I'm not using any uh, aggressive, hurtful uh, stuff at all. So I'm doing, I'm doing a note at the same time on this one, and you can see at the bottom, if I could show you the, um, I think it's called chymography, you could see like a long like um, uh, strip of these frames one by one. You'll see at the um, in chymography that there is a periodic vibration down at the bottom. Let me play it again for you. So what I have is like, now, I know that sounds really ugly, but a lot of people think that that sounds, um, <laughs> sounds like blues, sounds like Steven Tyler, sounds like, you know, um, it's, it's not a pretty sound. I, I really shouldn't be defending it, but I know that um, without having a song to put it in context, it sounds kind of uh, horrible, but uh, these kids, they need that sound. So anyway, that's what that is, is that the, um, in this anterior part right here, there was a vibration or a note, and then there's this chaos over here. Okay, so what I teach these kids is how to do that without that gag reflex that, uh, uh, that uh, most people think is necessary. Now, there is another kind of screaming that involves um, a position where the uh, arytenoids actually cover up your view of the true folds, and I call that the false chord scream, and that's your basic saxmo uh, 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 you know that uh, in that Ethel Merman thing, that scrapey thing, and I try to warn tenors and sopranos to stay away from that one uh, because it is something that's hard to keep up. Baritones don't have much problem with it because their folds are uh, a lot more resilient, they're you know, longer, thicker, and they can just handle it more, they don't get forces tenors and uh, sopranos and mezzos. Um, you know, both of these phonations take a special kind of support. I find that um, the false chord phonation takes more support, um, and if you lose that support, it, it, uh, it really scrapes and it really hurts. But that fly one, takes a very special, uh, subtle kind of uh, pressure. And I have uh, about 10 different sounds that I try, like strategies, to help people to learn 
how to do it. I have a large Simpson, and uh, I have like a kitty cat. But usually what happens, this is very interesting, usually what happens is that people listen to themselves while they're doing it. And it's so interesting that when you listen to your voice, the breathing stops, and then you lose the phonation. So then what happens is that the voice comes through and it starts a, a phonation. So when I'm teaching this to people in the beginning, they, they go, mm, mm, because they're listening to it. So they can't maintain the breath pressure and listen to their voices at the same time. My feeling is I think that when you listen to your voice and you become self-conscious, I believe that the sound suffers because the airflow becomes um, interrupted. And I think that's so interesting because this is what, what happens when I teach uh, this formation, especially God, to people. Uh, because they become self-conscious and they're trying to do it right. And then, you know, voice teachers are the hardest to teach this formation because we are taught to phonate. We are taught to onset, right? This is yes, no. So it's very difficult to teach a different kind of phonation that doesn't have a periodic vibration. I'd love to teach it to you. I would love to teach it to you, but I really need to have somebody next to me so that you can do it with me. And like I like to do it, I'll tell you what. Um, if you call me up, I'll teach you. <laughs> I could teach you on the phone. I feel very odd teaching on a, on a video screen because I need the feedback. Um, but it's in my second DVD. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions, but first of all, I just want to say something. Um, I, I want to thank um, Alan, and I, I want to thank Matt, and I want to thank all the teachers that share knowledge. Because I think that I could not be a teacher if I couldn't share what you know. In fact, you know, when I went to the Max uh, conference, there was something that I saw there that completely changed my teaching for the better. I saw this um, presentation um, by uh, Richard Lismar. It was about this octave rule, and it was such an eye opener because it, 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 it was just amazing. And it's just so great that we share information. I want you to share your information with me. I want to share my information with you because I think that when we share, we're all going to get better. We're all going to be better teachers. And I appreciate Max for doing what they do. And, um, and I appreciate you. And I want to hear your questions and your comments. And uh, I'm going to open it up. And thank you for having me. Melissa, well, can you I'll hear me very the... well? Oh. Oh. I, I can hear you. Oh, go, uh, go ahead, Alan, if you've got, con I, I can see the question. But if you um, can, go ahead. Um, when you have a student that's just starting out and you're trying to teach them, you mentioned a few of the kinds of uh, animal sounds and other things you try to get them to do. And I'm really interested in, in the ideas you talk about relative to not listening to yourself. How do you talk to them about, okay, don't, don't listen to yourself, just do it? Okay, that's a very important thing. That when a student walks in, that's the first thing I say. If I say, I'm going to explain to you some scientific things that need to be put in the language of your imagination. Because it's your imagination that is going to make your voice work. Your thinking will not make your voice work. So I tell them that as soon as they can start to see the sound, that they can draw the vowels, that they can make pictures by, you know, smearing. I use the example of like an A, the letter A, the vowel A, being a teepee. And being a, a person holding up the walls of capital A and being an A and not sounding like an A. In other words, I do all kinds of um, almost theatrical exercises where I have them draw noises, um, anything to get their mind off their voice. Because 
I, I sort of say, I'm going to put you on a mental diet, okay? The only thing that you're allowed to consider is, by the way, in strapless bra, which is basically one move that involves like expanding the lower rib cage, and only once in a while. I mean, that can, it can occur in a split second. Seeing the sound, being um, in the moment with the feeling, or talking the lyric. I mean, all of these thoughts go in and out very quickly, right? Um, and also, the other thing is um, audiating, which is hear the note before you get there. Because there is another thing that needs to be happening where, just like a violinist doesn't have a fret or a black and white key, you need to hear the pitch that you're going to, or you're going to spend all your energy searching for it. So I have exercises that basically make a map of the highest summit of the frequency of the note of the vowel. And I use this very sort of head resonant hee 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 hee. I call them monkey hee hees. And you say, um, say it would be happy birthday. The song is happy birthday. So in order to prepare to record or perform this song, they have to go hee 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 hee. Oops, I missed it. And if they miss it, they have to do it again. And they have to identify the intervals that they're not clear on. But that's just the first step of the recipe. But that audiating thing, and that, by the way, in Rochanda, and most importantly, over the pencil, because the sound needs to be like light coming out of your face. Now, it's really important in, in, in rock, in non-classical music, it's a rhythmic thing, a very rhythmic thing, and it's also a talking thing. So you almost have to wear your technique. You can't sing, because if you do something like singing, it becomes just ever so slightly contrived. It becomes like listen to me sing. But if you're speaking to pitch, but you're wearing, you're wearing the technique, you're not doing the technique, you have this like above the pencil thing, which is basically like that thing that I epitomize in the warm-up by tracking that, that, um, that, uh, that harmonic, that second harmonic, that, that, that head resonant thing. Like, I have that, imagine that feeling when they're doing the lyrics. So it kind of keeps the larynx kind of low. Not so low that it sounds plummy, though. But, in fact, when they're doing, like, when there's high notes, like, when you have this, like, idea of sound coming out of your face, basically, you're not, your larynx doesn't reach off anymore for high notes. That's another thing I say in the beginning, is that there are no more high notes and there's no more low notes. We have to get rid of all the spatial reasoning, right? No more up there, no more down there. It's all just a keyboard right here, and it's just another note. Beep, 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 just like this. So I use my imagination, my hands, my words, and my new DVD, which is rolling out online on March 12th, uses animation. So finally, I got animation to do what my hands can't do. So I have like swirly things, and I find that like the most um, amazing sounds come out of people when they stop thinking about their voice. So that's, I hope I answered the question. Kind of a long answer. I'm sorry, Alan. <laughs> I think uh, Ruth Ratliff has a question. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh... Hi, Ruth. Mom, can you get her on there? Some reason. Well, he, they're doing that, Melissa. There's several questions I, um, that have been typed in too. So after you, Ruth asked her questions, I'd love to get through as many as we can. Okay. Um, what do you want me to do? Oh, oh there's several people that have typed questions in. Oh, uh, can I see them? That I will read to you, but oh, we'll let I Ruth see. ask her. We'll let Ruth ask her question first. Okay. Hi, Ruth. Let's see if Ruth has her hand raised. Oh, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. Hi, Melissa. You know, I, I actually was just playing around with the button. <laughs> <laughs> I like to play with buttons, too. <laughs> but I, I wanted to tell you that I saw you at the Nats conference, and uh, I was just, I loved it. I thought you were so, um, so on. 
and uh, so so current and uh, really it was great it was wonderful and just and for all of the uh, the people the Nats people that are uh, there tonight I just want to say thank you so much for that convention it was a wonderful experience so that's all I just want to say good night and thank you for this by the way so thank much you. wonderful wonderful presentation thank you thank you. So let's move to um, a Darren Wicks uh, has a question about would you teach these method, methods to adolescent boys? Many of the boys that um, he teach want to be able to sing this style. Um, okay. And he, of course, is concerned about their vocal health. Okay. So um, the thing is, is like I said, it's very important. Excuse me, I need some water. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> middle voice. <coughs> They need to have a consistency of um, registration. So that I don't think there's it's never too soon to teach that. Because as their voices are changing, they're going to be able to accommodate those changes. Because they're going to be able to navigate all that registration, you know, craziness that happens in adolescence. Um, if their voice hasn't changed, I, I'd really like to stay away from the extreme uh, false chord stuff because I, I feel that that's like putting a three-year-old in toe shoes. You know, the, the, the tissues aren't formed yet and I, I, I would be afraid of uh, causing harm. However, if the voice has changed, you know, you can get right in there and it's very important, very important that they have like a good solid middle voice. Okay, that's so important. Before they address any of this extreme formation, even though the um, execution of this is not extreme in the least, it's so subtle that you can't do it without having a certain mastery of coordination. Like onset is so important. It's all about onset. That's the way people get damaged, is their onset is off. That's, that's the thing. So if you have anything that goes <coughs> like and it doesn't have that nice flowing thing, um, you, you're in trouble. So um, I definitely would teach somebody whose voice has changed to do all the extreme formations, but not before they develop another voice. Great. Um, Alan, can you open? There's an Ari Stern who um, would like to ask a question. Can we un, um, open their mic? And um, this person is a huge fan who owns both Zen of Screaming DV DVDs, and she has two questions. She'd be thrilled if you could answer one or both. Um, Are you on? Stern? Yeah, that. Ari, A-I, A-R-I. Oh, there she is. I see, her. I see it. I see it. We just we just need to open the mic. Okay. Let's go. Let's go to Juliet Singler, and then we'll come back to Ari. Okay. Can we let her there? So Juliet has a question. I wonder if you would demonstrate the deeper action that includes. False vocal fold action, and do you have any video of the fold doing this? Um, the, um, did you say the uh, the false word one? I'm sorry, I lost you there just for a moment. That's all right. It says, I wonder if you would demonstrate the deeper action that includes false vocal fold action. Okay. So, um, are you talking about when you say deeper? Are you talking about death metal one? Are you talking about false word? Are you talking about like the like? <laughs> that one? You know, their mic is not open. Um, okay. Melissa, All right. So I'm so going to have to address can't... both. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, okay. So the third formation that I didn't, um, uh, I didn't put on. It's on the DVD. All of these are on, um, uh, not high speed, but regular uh, stravoscopies are on the DVDs. Um, there is, is something that is um, common in death metal, which sounds like they call it the cookie monster. Um, vocal, which it involves like pushing air through the folds and these sort of bursts of air uh, 
require a great deal of coordination in the um, uh, subglottal pressure department, and it, 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 it's like it's like barking. It's like what I did on Kona. That's that. That one. So that one is sort of the deaf one, and then the false chord one is like, right? And what happens there? It's very interesting. Um, I have a uh, laryngoscope where you see what happens on that one is because there is such a closure um, in the, up, the the upper throat closes over the view of the two folds. So when you have a camera in there. It basically ejects the camera. <laughs> so what a do one doctor did was he actually probed through my closed throat to feel to see what my true folds were doing. And guess what? My true folds were singing. They were just doing regular, like periodic vibration. And but it was only for a, a split second because it was kind of like an aggressive thing where you had to like poke through my closed throat to get that view. But what was very interesting is that the distortion that happens on the false chord sound, and that's the one that has a pitch to it. Not, it's not the white noise. It's not that one. It's rock that has a pitch to it. That one, the two folds are doing the periodic vibration, and the false chords, although it's not always just the false chords. It's a bunch of stuff up there. It's just making you know, noise. That's the combined with the two folds periodic vibration, right? Whereas the fly one, I find, is much better because it translates to a sung note so easily. You can turn on a dime with that fly thing. So most of my um, people are doing fly, and um, you can also do low fly. Because if you make the shape of your throat with a, a great deal of um, space, you have like a very low frequency on that with and so you have, it sounds like death, but it's actually fraud. So um, you, you'll, you'll hear it. I mean, I'm, I would love for you to call me so I can go through it with you. Did that answer your question? I hope I did. I'll wait and see if she says yes. Um, and um, let's see. I just see Tom. Go ahead and open Ari's mic then. I just got your note. Hi. Can you, you, can you hear me now? There yeah. we go, Ari. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening, Melissa. Thank you so Hi, much for joining I us. Hi. Oh. I am an enormous fan. I have both of your DVDs. Mm -hmm. I sing both rock and classical, so I've worked with them extensively, um, and I trained uh, rock on my own and largely with the help of your DVDs. So cool. I know um, your, your DVDs touched briefly on this kind of fry heat false fold effect um, that's used for the classic 80s hair metal, and I'm talking Steven Tyler, Axl Rose, Sebastian Bach especially, and Sebastian Bach has mentioned that he uses mostly uh, mostly a pure registration with just a touch of this effect to get his sound. Yes, um, he uses black. Yes, yes. So are there any other hints you can give us, uh, like like Marge Simpson and, and the cat yell, good yes. exercises and vocalises to help uh, develop this coordination? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, by the way, it's in the second DVD, and it's called the C exercise, right? Okay. And uh, basically, uh, first of all, you need to get the idea of a flow. You need to have, with this consonant M, you need to have this flow with the consonant M. So you need to pretend that that is water coming out of your face, that your face is a pipe, and this now you must keep it up, up in your above the pencil in falsetto land, whatever you want to call it. Like beep beep up there. You can't go It's not that. It's like it needs to be very, very up there. Like don't let it fall down into your lower register. So you start with that M and you make it like flowing water. So as soon as you get this that's M. You keep that flow going and you Without stopping that flowing water, you change the shape of the pipe into a very classical R. So it sounds like this. Now, if you have that flow, if you have an even subglottal pressure and a nice flow, you'll be able to get that to 
do that. But what usually happens when people first start is they go into ah uh, and they start to phonate. They go, ma, <laughs> or they go, ah, and they drop the breath pressure because they listen, right? So this is a pretty tricky, um, I have about 10 different uh, strategies to start that M flow. Because some people can't get it in the beginning. So I, I use, um, I use, uh, sometimes I use a, 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 a rusty hinge, like, like a fence, like a squeaky fence, a door, the haunted castle door. <laughs> uh, I use um, a parrot, I use um, pterodactyl, <laughs> all kinds of different uh, strategies. And, you know, sometimes they don't get it on the first lesson, but they usually get it on the second one. Sometimes they call me in the middle of the night and say, I got it, I got it, I got it. But usually it's a, it's a, a suspension or a sustain. And it's very light. But remember, we're trying to, like, flat the vocal folds without making them touch. So there needs to be a very stable subglottal pressure. And it's, if you have too much subglottal pressure, you're going to phonate. So it's tricky. Okay. But go get the second DVD and spend some time with it. Thank you. I hope that helps. Great. Melissa, so George Williams has quite a few questions, but let me pick one of them because it, it's quite interesting. He, George Williams asks, when hey. it comes to ex extreme metal bands that are playing shows every night, mm -hmm. is it simply trying to produce too much volume that causes screamers to lose their voice? Or is there some reason why someone could do, say, every other day and stay healthy but could not do that night after night? Um, okay. First of all, baritones hardly ever get hurt for some reason, um, rarely. So a baritone uh, clock is like a much more um, resilient person, resilient voice. It's onset. It's making it, the reason that they are getting hurt is because their onset is off. Um, and because their onset is so um, aggressive, they're just, you know, lifting up the larynx and letting it fall and lifting up the larynx. And they're basically allowing the emotional influence of the music to take over the technique. So there needs to be kind of a, an observing ego that takes place where you really have to, like, understand that this is an acting game, really. But you have to be authentic at the same time. You know, some people learn how to do it by, um, they just get it, just by, by uh, they just have to get it, and they just get it. They just learn it over the years. Um, some people get, you know, really fried up, and they just use their fried up vocal folds, and they can't sing anymore, and that's unfortunate. Um, I think that there's another part of the question I forgot. Can you repeat that? It was a, a trick so, question. Uh, when it comes to um, trying to produce too much volume that causes screamers to lose their voice, or is there another reason why someone could do every other day and stay healthy but not every night? So I think if you do it, if you try to do it loud, you're going to get sliced up in one night. And people who don't have proper technique usually lose their voice completely on the third show, and they chase their tail for the rest of the tour, often canceling it. And that's when I, that's when they come to me. Hmm. And, and, um, when the tour is over, when they couldn't do it, you know. Um, there's been some really, really um, terrible, you know, like Wembley, you know, big, you know, events that were canceled because of this. So um, it's it's very important that like, some of these kids like get this right. But like I said, baritones have, you know, don't have too much trouble. Tenors have a lot of trouble if they don't. Great. Learn this. Thank you. Um, yeah, and. From here in the Pacific Northwest, my colleague Sharon Buck would like to know, can you demonstrate the pencil idea? Sure. Uh, let's see. Do I have a pencil? Okay, let's, let's use my, I'm going to use my finger. Okay. I'm okay. It's a number two pencil. This is my finger. Can you see me? Okay, so um, what I do is I put a pencil in their teeth, in the front teeth, right? And I say, okay, I want you to pretend like you're in a country western bar. <laughs> 
and I want you to make this noise. I want you to go, yee, like that. And they do that very easily. And I point out to them, I sort of say, now, if there's something happening uh, below, down in the lower extremity, that when it does, yee, something downstairs is going, boom, boom. And I have a word for that for girls and a word for that for guys. But let's get with, uh, above the pencil. I demonstrate that yee, feels like, the sound is emanating from somewhere from the pencil here, maybe even out the back, but somewhere up here. But if I do that sound, I go, eee, it feels like it's coming from below the pencil. So I have them compare those two, yee, and eee, right? And I say, everything that you speak, scream, and sing will forever be above the pencil, amen. Nothing will go from below the pencil. Because this is not a sound. This is not a sound. It's a head trip. It's just pretend. Because what happens when you pretend above the pencil is your larynx stays low. And I'll demonstrate that. And I always do. You see my, um, I show them that when I go, yee, my larynx kind of hangs out. But if I go, ee, ee, right, my larynx jumps up way high, right? And this is, I show them that this is how you get hurt. When your larynx jumps up and lies down and jumps up and lies down, it gets pissed off. It gets the, uh, the, the actual, like, velocity of that diamond causes uh, abrasions, like polyps, which are blisters, and, uh, you know, um, nodules, which is like scar. And I tell them that that's because of this, like, overuse. So above the pencil is a head trip. It's just a head trip. But my exercises epitomize, especially with the vowel E, from low, the lower register, particularly, through the upper register, what it feels like to stay above the pencil. So I have them start the second exercise is something called the French doorbell. This stuff's really wacky. So I have them make this really, first of all, I find their sweet spot, which is the lowest pitch that they can hum where it feels like it's in their face. Uh, and I, that's called the sweet spot. And then I have them go, eh, like, come on, like a really ugly, like, just kind of sit on that noise, like, like funny or like trans wrestler, and have them go, eh, and I have to pretend that's the pencil. Eh, and then I have them go, eh, which is very, very, very silly. They do try, very silly. Not pushing down too much, but I use, like, funny characters, and they laugh. <laughs> and I go, and you hear that little, that little flip, and that, that sound effect, we work at that sound effect on pitches, and it goes right through the passaggio without a break, because in order to make that sound effect, to continue that sound effect, they have to use a certain amount of pressure to get the sound effect to be consistent. So it's not singing. We don't do any singing. <laughs> we just do noises. And then all of a sudden, all those pretend things, they just kind of work. And they just sing the song, and it sounds good. That's, did I explain it? <laughs> it's crazy. Great. Can you hear me? Alan, are you still there? I am. Great. Let's, how about we have one more question before we close out since we started late? Is that all right, Melissa? Sure. I, I've, I've been oh. all night. Okay. So um, we have a question about please elaborate on the concept mentioned modification of the vocal tract. Is this a specific voluntary vocal function or a muscular command? How does one relate to it or communicate it with the student? It's vowel shapes. Um, and um, they, are, are you talking about it with, with screaming, or are you talking about with singing a higher, um, I'm not sure, in what context? Yeah, modification. Modi it was, yeah, modification of vocal tract. What, was I that for screaming or for singing? Oh, I think for, for screaming. screaming. For yeah. screaming? Okay, screaming. Okay, so the way I, I transmit that information is with vowel shapes, because with, um, you know, oh, he said uh, both. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, for both? Okay, it's yeah. both. Okay. okay. So with screaming, right, um, I, I have them go through this 
something called the C exercise. And I have them start with this um, an imaginary C. Oops. I have them draw a C on the side of their face. And I start that M sound where the pencil would be. And then that ah is like to be parallel with the top of your skull, like the top curve of the C. So it goes ah, right? So it needs a nice big apple, you know, just like when you learn the opera, how to do ah. And then you go to O, and that has a much different, like, overtone series, because that's the bottom curve of the C. So it's like, but you need to keep that upper frequency in the O. But you, it's like you got to keep, I always like to start with the higher stuff and add the low to the high, because you want to keep as much high stuff in there so, you can, so that you can hear it over the band. But that's the volume. That high frequency is the thing that makes it sound loud. It's not dB level. It's that, it's that, that makes it sound loud. It hits people. Because <laughs> when that hits a microphone, that is brutal sounding. It doesn't need to be loud. It doesn't need to be loud at all. Now with singing, that's a whole different thing. Because usually, um, that spatial reasoning thing, when people think of high notes, they raise their larynx and there's not enough room to, not only to make the, the, the stretch the full for the pitch, but the vowel is not enough room for the shape of the vowel. So, I mean, you learn about this in classical music. You learn about vowel modification. So, usually, um, you know, it, it, we, we talk about, like, in that five-star recipe that I told you about where I start with the hee-hees, it's like the fourth step of that exercise uh, deals with uh, vowel shapes, uh, with the tongue forward, and then having to make certain vowels um, slightly modified so that they don't, so that they sound smooth. Like different vowels have different different things. But rather than you know say do ahs like this and eyes like this, it's, there's a sort of a technique that you can wear so that it does you don't have to be academic about you know what vowel am I modifying? You know it's. Uh, it's in the next DVD. It's coming up. <laughs> it's coming up. All right. What a perfect way to, to close. Before I turn it over to Alan, since he's got video, I just want to uh, thank all of our chatters for tonight and your patience tonight. I'm so sorry not to be with you via video. Um, and just to remind people that March 8th is our, a conversation with Andrew Lippa. That will be our next Nat chat, so I'm sure that will be very uh, popular as well, so please register. And Melissa, you are a wealth of knowledge and so generous. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Alan, you. I'm going to let you say good, the, the, the good night since you can, they can see you. Okay. Well, um, really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. We'll be here with Melissa, and we'll look forward to uh, March, uh, where we'll have Andrew Lippa. And uh, Andrew was also with us recently at a conference and uh, is such a great uh, person, a great teacher, a great, you know, just a giving person. So I know you'll have a great conversation with him uh, then. And so, uh, and we want to again thank Melissa for being with us. We really appreciate all the things that you're bringing uh, to our profession and how you're uh, really helping people save their voices and, uh, and, and helping us give us some real skills to deal with some of the students that come into our studios every week. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Take Bye. care. Good night, everyone. Bye, everybody.